Okay, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. It's Monday morning. Okay, and we're talking about the middle way, not the middle kingdom, although that's relevant to this discussion. It's the middle way. And we're talking about, you know, current events, important current events. And we've entitled this show uh, China EU deal, the China EU deal, what it means to the US. And that, of course, opens up all kinds of other issues. And we have Russell Liu, he's our regular contributor, and Alexander. Horawa, I get that, Morawa, sorry. Um, Alexander is a lawyer in Phoenix, Arizona, where it gets hot. Okay. All right, Russell, up to you now as our regular contributor here to introduce Alexander and to introduce the subject of our discussion. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Jay. Um, I'd like to introduce Alex Morawa. Alex comes with a, a very, very um, interesting background. Alex is a international law professor. Um, he teaches in the faculty in, the, uh, in Europe in Vienna. He's also uh, teaching in Washington, D.C. He's the American law professor. Uh, and he's also uh, taught and lectured in China, um, just like myself. And today we're going to hear from Alexander and, and in this discussion really about the uh, EU-China investment deal. It's made, it's made really big news, uh, especially in Europe and China. Maybe not so much it's hidden on the radar in the U.S. One of the things that President Biden had promised to do after the Trump years was to uh, build a coalition of like alliance with the EU in dealing and tackling with some of the problems such as investments in China, intellectual property protection, so forth. Um, however, it's interesting that just before Biden uh, came and stepped into the office, the deal was signed. It was a sign, it was not signed, but it was concluded between the EU and China. And the interesting part about it is that U.S. is nowhere in sight. Uh, and so now, President Biden has a formidable task of figuring how to restructure the relationship with China after the Trump years. Without the EU's coalition and support, it might make it very interesting and maybe a complicated. So we're going to talk about how this EU-China uh, investment deal, how does it affect the U.S.? How does it affect President Biden? So um, Alexander is going to uh, give us some thoughts about it, uh, and we're going to hear about what what is this agreement about. Maybe we'll, well, I'll turn it back to you, Jay, for, if you have any questions, or Alex can talk about just what is this agreement. Yeah, let's start with that, Alexander. I mean, uh, you know, that happened um, clearly as a reaction to the U.S. Um, to the Trump unwillingness, the Trump isolation, uh, the, the Trump turn your back on Europe, turn your back on Asia. Um, but, you know, what is the significance of it? And also, let me add, what is the significance of it that it was inked just before Biden was inaugurated? Thank you, Chair. That's, that's all very good questions. Um, this has been in the making for quite a while. I mean, the negotiation's been running for about seven years. So it predates Trump, actually. Uh, so it, it's not, a, not an, an, an exclusive reaction to the Trump four years. But as you said, it's certainly remarkable that it happened uh, late December of last year after the elections had been won. I guess we all agreed that it has been won actually November 7th or so. Uh, the timing is quite remarkable. I believe it was intended to be concluded before Biden enters. Uh, into office, uh, and that's for political reasons as well. I do not think this is an intentional European affront against the United States. It certainly follows uh, European interests in this respect. Uh, you also see quite a lot of differences really between our framework number one agreement that we concluded with China about a year ago uh, and this one structurally as, as, as far as how the mechanisms operate, but also with what is covered. I mean, this is basically a liberalization uh, agreement. Uh, it doesn't uh, qualify as a, as a trade agreement in the traditional sense. So there is no exchange of goods that's been talked about. It just allows EU companies and Chinese companies to operate more freely and with fewer barriers in the respective other market. What it adds, and, and framework one doesn't have much of that, it adds mechanisms for uh, implementation and mechanisms for conflict resolution, which is quite remarkable here. There are a few things lacking if you, if you go... Uh, and, and review what commentators have said recently, human rights is an issue, labor standards is an issue, the environment is mentioned, which is quite remarkable, but um, not necessarily in the form of binding arrangements, more uh, uh, aspirations and intentions. 
in, in the agreement itself. It refers them it refers to existing international law, including the Paris Agreement. But in itself, the uh, agreement speaks more of intentions in this area. Well, you know, the, the thing about it is over time, whether it's Trump or Biden or for that matter, any American president, uh, over time, we lose um, our primacy by virtue of this agreement. And maybe it was long in coming, as you say, um, but over the years, um, the EU, which needs trading partners, especially in view of Brexit, you know, they're probably hungry uh, to make trading arrangements everywhere, and, and China fell right into that. Um, seems to me that over time, this will, this will actually undermine the U.S. primacy, the primacy we used to have uh, in global economics, don't you think? Older, you know, we, we use the term middle kingdom. I think it increasingly becomes a kingdom that is truly in the center of global trade and, and, and global business. Uh, so now the U.S.-China agreement is one of several that China has with others. Previously, it was the United States in the middle that had various agreements with others. So that alone shows that, that China certainly maneuvers towards a center of international uh, economic exchange and, and political uh, reality is there too. This is not just economic, this is geopolitical as well. Yeah, and this, this takes me to a thought I've had for a long time, and that is, although, you know, there were processes and, you know, uh, ongoing processes before Trump, fact is that he got into office and first thing he did is he blamed them for the, the, the virus, he called it the China virus, and then he got into a trade war, which seemed to me to be completely unnecessary. It, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that <clears throat> while Trump was in office, he was doing like everything he could, seemed to me, just as an observer, to alienate China, to, to put stress and tension into the relationship without any significant benefit. I can't think of a single benefit. Meanwhile, you know, everyone said, well, you know, Xi Jinping is a very smart guy and the Politburo knows how to act as one will under Xi Jinping. And so they said, well, OK, this is really an opportunity. Every every, you know, kind of mm, disruption like this is an opportunity. So we are going to do everything we can while Trump is standing still or going backward in terms of national management in the U.S., we're going to do everything we can to advance China's interests. And this, the deal with the EU is one of them. The RACIP deal in, uh, in Asia is another. Cut the U.S. out. Um, and last night on uh, 60 Minutes, it was, it was clear that they have um, gone ahead of us in biotech uh, for many reasons. Uh, they have gone ahead of us in 5G. Uh, Russell sent an article about me Megalev trains uh, that, run, that will run Beijing to Shanghai in 3.5 hours. I mean, they, they have taken the opportunity, um, maybe while Trump wasn't watching, if he ever was watching, um, to advance their interest way ahead of ours. There's no single issue, no single initiative that I can think of where they have not done remarkable things even in the last four years. What do you think, Alexander? I would agree. Yes, certainly uh, the kind of agreements that they're concluding and the kind of political stance they're taking is based on a solid foundation of technology, uh, economic strength, and, and also in, in many ways dealing with catastrophes in a way that is significantly more effective than we are. Uh, COVID, the COVID response certainly was not a prime example in protecting individual rights in China, but it was effective as far as controlling the pandemic was. A uh, very Chinese solution in a way. Um, I, I would agree that uh, whatever the intentions of the US were in dealing with China for the past four years, the way the conversation was going was in every single way alienating China. You, you don't bully China, you negotiate in China. You show respect and, and allow people to, sh to preserve the face when you negotiate. Many times an agreement in China is really the starting point for further agreements and ultimately a, a relationship. And if you just come in bullying, that's not gonna that's not gonna work. But I agree with you. It's certainly a, a position of strength. I mean, China is now uh, considering itself a valid partner for many others. Uh, it, it will by all standards. I'm not an economist, but many people say it will surpass the U.S. in in significance as a as a hub of trade and, and innovation and technology very soon. So, absolutely, they can afford that. 
Yeah, there are certain elements of this that are <clears throat> that I don't think the American public realizes. For example, AI. AI is, is a new technology. I mean, is it 10 years old? Is it 15 years old? China saw that and China moved ahead and China is ahead of us in AI. And some people feel that AI will ultimately rule the world because you can, you can do so much management with AI. You can manage companies, you can manage cities, you can manage states, you can take the burden off um, uh, officials who may not be up to the task. It's the way um, it's the way computer science uh, can actually run our world, at least in substantial part, and they have an advantage. And in biotech, pursuant to the um, 60 Minutes article yesterday, they're they're ahead of us in biotech, and we don't even know the implications of what that means. Uh, and in you know, in dealing with virus and the genome, dealing with not only coronavirus but any other virus that comes down the pike. So you know, it's it's not just that Trump has alienated them. And it's not just that they have moved ahead on so many fronts, uh, accelerating in the Trump years. It's that a lot of these things they have done puts them ahead of the U.S. And they're not only competitive, you know, in, a, in an economic sense, they're competitive in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a competitive sense with the U.S. These things taken individually and certainly taken collectively mean that they are ahead of us and that they can they can beat us and beat us up in the national uh, the global trade arena in the technology arena in you know and people say for example that their prowess um, in computer science makes them the best national hacking organization in the world better way better than Russia for example so in, in a competitive world, in a hostile competitive world, they have taken this opportunity to get ahead of us. And this creates a problem. And I'm going to Russell's outline, so I should address this to him. Um, so, you know, in your outline, you suggest that you cannot be competitive with China. Rather, you cannot negotiate with China. To go to your last point, uh, you know, in a global sense, if you are not competitive, because you don't have the competitive advantage. You don't have the negotiating leverage. And, and because we have lost the negotiating leverage, our negotiating position is, is way less than it was, say, 10 years ago. What do you think about that, Russell? You, you, you've embraced that idea. Why don't you expre ex express it? Well, I think the problem that we're facing is, is more than just surface. It, it goes really deep. It goes back, predates the Trump years uh, for many years, where what the Chinese saw is, as an opportunity uh, to build their infrastructure to build their STEM, to build all the background uh, uh, that they needed to um, accelerate. And, and they knew that technology was going to be key ever since the internet uh, uh, was made available to them in the late 90s. <clears throat> and so the problem that they saw, the opportunity, is that the, the um, friction in the, our own uh, governing bodies means that the Republicans and Democrats can't work together to do infrastructure projects. They're going to be opposing each other. China has been able to uh, put up a high-speed rail through the countryside so that goods, things will not only just be on the seaboard, but going through the middle of the country. They've set up their uh, communication system so everyone, um, even the people in the rural areas, have access to um, uh, smartphones. So in other words, um, they have built an economy based on investing in infrastructure, based on having an, uh, a STEM uh, push through their country uh, in, the, in the education, in the colleges. Uh, so now what we're seeing is a result of that investment. So the big challenge that Biden faces again is we're way behind because we didn't do these things. We've been parties have been fighting each other politically. I think that's what the EU saw. What they saw was the last straw. When they saw that when President Trump came in, the uh, alienation of the parties, they can't work together. So in other words, the U.S. is not going to help us. We have to help. It's us. a loss of confidence in the U.S. and Appreciate justified. It. 
is completely justified, at least at this moment, I mean, through the Trump administration. But Alexander, how, you know, how does this affect American investment in China? You know, if you if you go back a few years, say, the, say 20 years ago, in the beginning of the, um, you know, the century, you find an excitement. R Russell was there, he knows. You, you find an excitement about American investment. Sure, there were limitations in the Chinese and had all this control of foreign investment in the, in the WUFI and the partnership arrangements they set up. Um, and, and clearly they wanted to get our IP and all that. How is it now? How has it changed? Um, if I'm a multinational or even a medium-sized company, what are my prospects in, in having a successful investment relationship in China? Well, if you look at the, the framework that we have in place now for doing investments in China, I think a European corporation probably has an advantage because of this agreement. Uh, bear in mind, this agreement is still a draft. It has not formally been ratified. So it, it might be ratified. Some people say it might not be ratified, but the mere fact that it's there, it has been negotiated to a certain extent, boosts the chances of European corporations. Uh, also bear in mind, apart from the economic side, there is a corporate responsibility aspect that is growing when, it, when you look at multinationals. That comes from sustainability very, very strongly, but also from the uh, area of, of labor rights, labor standards, and human rights, ultimately. Uh, the fact that the European agreement has those elements in there, again, as I said initially, in a pragmatic and programmatic form, not necessarily as binding obligations, uh, gives those companies a boost as well when it comes to their own stakeholders and shareholders. So I think uh, it's a moral boost as much as it's an economic boost in many ways. Uh, the fact that we in the European Union now we have a centralized agreement that kind of replaces or at least mostly replaces the, the plethora of, of bilateral investment agreements uh, will certainly help streamline the coordinated approach as well. I mean, European companies now have uh, this foundational documents to work together when it comes to investing. Uh, of course, Europe also opens the doors now to uh, Chinese investors, specifically in the renewable energy market area. So China will have advantages there as well. Some economists that I've read suggest that the EU actually has the uh, a better end of the deal in many ways. I mean, they get more immediately out of that agreement when it comes to opportunities of investing, because China already was massively invested in Europe, while the other way around the world, more limitations, that's correct. On the other hand, I think it kind of levels the playing field now. So now we have a level playing field between the Europeans and the Chinese, and we have something not quite level when it comes to the relationship between US corporations and, and the Chinese. So that puts us at a disadvantage here, for sure. Let me throw one more element in, and that's the RACIP agreement um, in, in Asia. Chinese did the same thing a little earlier. Um, and uh, they cut us out, or we cut ourselves out, more likely. Uh, and now they have, um, uh, I guess it's similar, but I wonder if you could distinguish the two um, and tell us what the implication of that agreement is and how, how close that agreement is to the EU agreement. Yeah, and China was setting this up at a time when we were fumbling around with NAFTA and its successor, basically. I mean, as much as you could criticize NAFTA as being less than perfect, it still gave North America something like a free trade agreement, to a certain extent, at least. And there were barriers in place as well. Uh, now, China, and that goes back to where it sees itself, I believe, feels strong enough to say we will be the center of another agreement that involves 14 more or less powerful economies in the region, right? Uh, we, we, we've seen a shift that, again, not just economic, that's geopolitical as well, that there are emerging powers who are not striving necessarily to become one of the superpowers, but strive to become one of the regional powers. A good example, of course, is Turkey. Right? Turkey has a similar approach that it wants to be a force to be reckoned with when it comes to the Middle East. And as we have seen recently, it does. It can go head to head with Turkey, uh, with, with Russia, and it can win a confrontation with one of the traditional superpowers. So I think we always have to put a great agreements like this into the overall geopolitical political context. And then the political context of, of course, our past administration being uh, not very effective when it comes to dealing with any kind of partners or enemies that are out there. And, and doing those four years will be a challenge. So um, the Biden international team certainly has the hands full at this point in time just to scramble to get things back on track. And then it will take a while to get back 
if we can get there back to where we actually want to be. I want to uh, I want to ask you about that, but first I want to ask you about uh, uh, One Belt Road or Belt and Road Initiative. Um, I just want to ask you how that is doing here in the, in the time of COVID, in the time of such you know global disruptions. Uh, to say nothing about climate change as well. I mean, it was a very ambitious program. It is a very ambitious program, and I wonder a uh, whether it, it, it continues at the same pace. And b, you know, we talk about agreements with EU. We talk about agreements with, um, you know, with uh, Asia, a other Asian countries. But when we talk about Belt Road. We're talking about dozens, hundreds of agreements that China is making, smaller economic agreements for loans, for development, for who knows what, all over, continent by continent. And when you take that collectively, that also has an effect on this very same process we're talking about, namely cutting out the U.S. Am I right? Very much so. I think uh, speaking as an international lawyer, not an economist, uh, having a more diverse portfolio of smaller agreements, some of them legally binding, some of them more informal agreements, puts a power like China in a very advantageous position. Uh, one of the disadvantages of, of a large settlement style agreement like the EU-China one, of course, is it's very prominent, it's being talked about all over the place. And it will ultimately be implemented in a very public fashion. So if there's conflicts in the future, you will have a settlement mechanism that actually decides matters, like a little bit of a, a WTO-ish kind of process. So this will be very much public and the, the press will be reporting about that. If you have a multitude of little individual agreements, and some of them not necessarily the state, but state-controlled enterprises with enterprises in foreign entities, you have much more diversity and much less scrutiny sometimes. Uh, I, I believe China specifically, looking at other Asian countries, but also Africa, has done a tremendous job when it comes to uh, exerting influence without appearing to exert influence. Uh, and that's a smart strategy. Yeah, they are smart they're, and they're focused. And, you know, the more we watch them move, the more you know, we have to stand in admiration. Um, so you, you alluded to it a minute ago about what, what, is, what is Biden going to do? What are his options? If you were on his team, what would you suggest he do? Because this is really a very significant threat. Um, if we care about primacy, but even if we don't care about primacy, even if we just care about survival, economic survival in the world today, about the, you know, the continuation of the dollar as the reserve currency, all those things, um, what would you advise Biden to do to maintain our position and uh, you know, correct the errors of the Trump administration and before? A monumental task, I can say, and, and if anybody had an actual answer to this, I think you'd be a multimillionaire right away. Uh, but what you certainly have to do as a first step is repair the relationship with the allies. That's a crucial factor, and I think first steps have been taken in this respect. When you say Second, allies, do you mean European allies or Asian Europeans, allies? but also regional allies that are pretty much all over the place. You know, there's mm -hmm. the, the military component of allies, but there's also an ally uh, that's cultural, economic, political, um, you know, the democratic approach, if you look at Biden's program, one very strong focus is diplomacy and democracy. Uh, that certainly puts you in, in contact with allies that go well, well beyond Western Europe or the European Union or even the Council of Europe. Europe. Uh, that puts you in a firm standing in, in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and so on. And secondly, apart from facing the obvious competitors, and we have to distinguish whether they're enemies or competitors, that's a crucial factor too. I think going for those who are kind of on the edge, who have been friendly towards the US traditionally, but have become less friendly over the past four years, uh, those are the most important things. Your, your, your old friends many times come back to you more easily, I think, once you show your goodwill. Your you know, neutral but friendly leaning uh, partners have more of a challenge when it comes to also convincing their own populations that now we trust the US again. So I think that would be strategy number two. And then uh, you know, never forget to combine, very strategically combine economic interests with geopolitical interests. Uh, 50 years ago, you could say we, were, we have economic interests in one box and then the political alliances in a different box and military alliances in another box. They're all in the same box now. They're, they're interrelated and they cannot be subdivided or singled out. So you need to look at this holistically in many ways. Yeah. 
that's the way things have turned out, isn't it? So, so if I if I'm the U.S., if I'm Biden, would it pay for me to try to negotiate a deal with the EU, the very same members of the EU uh, that works, um, you know, on a parallel basis, perhaps a better basis, a smarter basis uh, than the China deal with the EU? I mean, would that work? Could I wean them away into a separate U.S. EU deal? Well, we, we still have the EU-US deal in many ways. I mean, the economic ties were not severed. They were still in existence. There were some problems in there. The, the, again, being a lawyer, not an economist, I can look at this from the international legal perspective more than the economic one. I don't think there was a, uh, a significant disruption of the legal relationship and the political relationship. There were dents put into it, for sure. NATO being, of course, a, a very classical example here. Uh, so those are already in existence and free trade between the US and Europe is still ongoing. Uh, but now this free trade within Europe will certainly focus away a little bit towards Asia. How does the US go back into this relationship and how ideally would we rebuild a joint operation with the European Union and other partners around the world that check and balance China a little bit? Right. We, we probably will not be able to stop China from becoming the economic superpower number one in the future. But we need to have something to counter that. Well, it, it strikes me when you say that maybe what we have to counter that is what they touched on in the EU agreement, but which they may not be able to conclude, really conclude with, with China. And that is the morality side. Um, you know, what, what we've seen in the world today um, is um, a lot of war crimes. Uh, we've seen uh, the, uh, Ai Weiwei's movie about human flow and 65 million people behind barbed wire in one place or another. Um, There's a big morality issue and it's global. And, what, and one of the things that Trump lost and threw away, if you will, aside from his economic isolation and diplomatic isolation, is the, the, the U.S. leadership in morality. That's a special card. And uh, I, from what you were saying earlier, it may be that if we play that card with our existing allies who are willing to come back to us and be a moral leader around the world, we could, we could, attract, we could attract a lot of people back with our special morality sauce, don't you think? <laughs> uh, let's hope we can get back to that, I think. If, if you look at the EU agreement, and we've been looking at it really from more an economic uh, standpoint right now, it, it does contain language that is very much morality-based, if you want to call it that, uh, from labor standards to uh, procedural guarantees, friendly settlement of disputes, and so on, and a, a few hints of human rights as well. On the other hand, the agreement is, is quite weak on that front. There could have been more done in this respect. There's one example, a provision that relates to how um, individual license procedures shall be handled if there is conflict. Uh, within the European Union, it's clear this is a civil obligation. Therefore, a court is responsible for making determinations. In the agreement, it refers to a court or a quasi-court or an administrative agency. The European Union would have been very, very strongly backed by its own law if it said, no, we need judicial implementation of licensing decisions and of sanctions in the context of license, licensing conditions. They let themselves be negotiated out of this and forego, in a way, actually legal obligations that they already have. So they can't come back and say, we are not on the, sitting on the high horse from the moral point of view because we put all this in. Partly it's not very strong and partly they're really backed out of things that they could have very easily insisted on. And I don't think China would have had a major problem having the intermediate people's courts make decisions on licensing issues instead of some you know, government agency. Yeah, well, it's a lot of ground to be covered here. But, I'm, you know, Biden is a smart guy with smart uh, counsel around him and... Um, Maybe he can figure these things out. All he has to do is listen to our show. It'll help him. That is true. Uh, Russell, Russell, you know, to go to your point, which I think is really important, is that if we are going to uh, negotiate with China and get back into, uh, I don't want to say normalization, but some sort of some sort of negotiation of equals, so to speak, we're going to have to become an equal in many areas. Um, and I think that's a, it's really an important point. But how do we do that now? We have been declining in so many arenas. How do we do that? What would you advise Biden on that? 
Well, I, Jay, that's a very good question. I think the problem is uh, going back to what China looks at us. Um, maybe we're no longer equals because an example is China being able to conclude a deal with the EU separately without the U.S. China has been able to conclude a deal uh, with the uh, Eastern Asian countries without the U.S. Um, and I think when we go back to it, if I were the EU also, and I'm looking at Biden, uh, we don't know uh, how uh, you can be equal when you have so many problems at home domestically. You you can't, even if we get a deal we do with America, um, China, or EU, uh, you have a divided Congress. You know, there are many uh, things that may not be able to get done, you know. Um, so again, we're not at the point where um, we may be considered as equal anymore because we are a very dysfunctional um, uh, government uh, now in, in many sense all uh, you know the January 6 uh, domestic problem the infighting between the two parties so nothing can get done so that's a, that's a big problem so Biden has a big problem there and this the, and get the bigger picture is I think you have to win the trust back and credibility uh, working together for example on climate change with China you have to start in some area to start working together uh, that key is working together uh, and right now, China doesn't see that happening. Um, we're not working together. It may require start finding projects where you can actually do things together. That's restoring the trust, restoring the relationship. So it's a big relationship problem, Jay. Um, yeah. So, so uh, uh, Alexander, do you agree with that? I mean, is it doable is my question. Uh, or have we passed over the Rubicon here and and will we, you know, for the next generation be behind the curve, whatever we try? No, I think that in international relations is always comes in cycles. So I think we, we, we never cross the Rubicon without a chance of finding a bridge to back <laughs> across the Rubicon to the other end. Uh, Caesar would have liked that probably, I'm not sure. Uh, but I think we, we definitely can do that. What, what I would recommend to the Biden team, and yes, they should watch this show, probably going a little bit more aggressive when it comes to ratifying treaties that show that we are morally uh, leaders, right? So ratifying, for instance, the Inter-American Convention of Human Rights and becoming part of this continental system of human rights protection, which has been lingering for 40 plus years now, would be a very advisable step and would not really take away of our sovereignty. It would actually give us a chance to reflect on whether we are still the leaders of constitutional rights. Uh, in settling more proceedings in, in, in an amicable way, instead of the, the bullying approach that we've been experiencing recently, but just subjecting ourselves more to international judicial scrutiny, which again, does not take away from our sovereignty, but makes us much more firm in our standing that we actually partners in the international arena would be extremely advisable. Now with a 50-50 Senate that has, has to approve every one of these initiatives, we, we are in trouble. We will probably not achieve it. So. I think Russell is absolutely right that we're in a big political conundrum here. And we need to clean house first, right? We can't go international and say we're good now if we're not actually showing that we are. Yeah, I mean, if I'm, if I'm just John Q. Everyman or I'm John Q. Everyman in Europe, for example, and I look at the US, I say, aside from all of the squabbles, this is not efficient. This is a huge waste of time and resources. You know, this is this is this is killing the country, the economy, and its collective will, um, and that kind of inefficiency really puts us at a tremendous disadvantage. However, it happens. So anyway, Russell, <clears throat> your time to summarize and say farewell to our discussion. Well, I, again. Um... I, I think Alexander has brought up some really good points about the disagreement, how it impacts us. Uh, and um, I think that um, I don't think the agreement that was concluded hurts American interest. In, in fact, it, it I would say that it's a leverage to say it's a starting point where America can aspire to do maybe more than the EU agreement. It's it's a it's a it's a benchmark, a framework, because you know some of the things that the Chinese have agreed to is in good faith, move towards the labor conventions, of, uh, uh, more transparency, non discrimination. For example, in China, a Chinese company when it procures supplies, uh, they can't discriminate against some um, the European companies. Well, you know we can have the same thing with Americans. There's a there's a starting point where we can do more, possibly. Uh, but again, I think I go back to it. Um, 
I really think that we have to start at home to, if we're going to actually show the world that we can do something. We have to be unified in many respects. Yeah, we have to take the racism out. Yes. Uh, that would that would be a really good start right now. Anyway, Russell Liu, a Hawaii lawyer who has years of experience practicing and teaching in China, Alexander Morawa, uh, a, uh, a lawyer in um, in um, Phoenix, Arizona, uh, who is an international lawyer. Thank you very much for your contributions to this conversation. Really appreciate you coming on. Thank you, Russell, for setting it up. Um, I think it's been very valuable, and I'm I'm sending a copy of the tape to the White House. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you too for that and for having us. It was a pleasure. Aloha. Aloha. Aloha.